Swami said once, he said, firstly, for your good fortune in coming to me, you must give thanks to the merits earned in previous lives. Has Baba transformed your life? A little, just a little. <laughs> How? I, I'm not the same person that I was then. I know nothing. I can do nothing. I am nothing, but at the same time knowing that you are everything. Amen. To me, Sai Baba is everything. I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for Sai Baba. Since 1979, they have been coming from Australia to visit Indian holy man Sri Satya Sai Baba, Arthur and Poppy Hilko. For them, Sai Baba is their loving teacher, and more. Welcome to Soul Germs. This interview was recorded in Prashanti Niliam, India in December 2006. I came to Swami first in uh, 1979. Uh, how I had come to know about Swami, a man was speaking one time and I was listening and uh, he said you should read the book Sai Baba, The Holy Man and the Psychiatrist. But for two years I dodged that. Whenever I saw the book I thought I must get that one day. The man was back two years later, uh, which was early 1979, and he, uh, uh, a lady said there, Arthur, I have a bookseller friend that's in difficulties financially and I've bought a lot of books off him and one of those books is almost shouting at me that I must give it to you. And when she gave it to me, it was Sai Baba, the holy man, the psychiatrist. So Swami got tired of waiting for me to, to buy the book. And uh, I read that on all I'd ever wanted to say, all I ever felt within myself was there. All I wanted to do was to come to India to see Swami. And I came in 1979. It wasn't an easy journey because I came alone. And uh, a cultural shock, uh, different things happened, food wasn't quite right for me. So I went through some difficulties but uh, Swami took me to the bottom in all ways. But he was always there then to pick me back up again. And uh, with this tremendous love. And I wondered if he ever spoke to me how I could answer. How could I reply to the divinity itself? I guess say. <laughs> and uh, Swami made it easy for me. He came, and I'd been sitting in my room that morning, thinking, oh, if only Swami would send me home. And when I got up to Darshan, and when he came out, at that time there was only half a row. And he would come, and I, because I didn't know how I could answer or speak to him, as he would come, I'd drop my eyes and watch his feet go by, and when he'd gone by, I'd look up. But on the third day, when I was saying, Swami, send me home, the same thing happened, except that as soon as I looked up again, he turned round <laughs> and said, where are you from? <laughs> and it was simple, you see, Australia Swami. Mm -hmm. He looked at me for a little while, then he said, are you staying a little longer? <laughs> and of course I melted I said yes Swami and he placed his hand on my head and said 
That is very good. I will see you. And his touch, and he walked away, left me sitting there, sobbing. No. Oh. How did he have the power to make you sob? His love. You've been around loving, loving people before without sobbing. I felt love, but I've never ever felt it. Divine love until uh, I come to Swami. Admittedly, uh, when I was about 14, I wanted to speak about God. I had a yearning for it. But as I say, I was very fortunate nobody asked me to <laughs> because I wouldn't have known what to say. But the yearning was there. What does divine love feel like? You're asking me to explain the inexplainable? Yes, I am. Yes. It is a love beyond anything you've ever experienced before. There are no words to explain that. You can only feel that and know it. And now you're in the presence of divinity. What more can one say about that? And you've never had that experience before. Oh, where could you have that experience before? In church? No, no. It's not the same. Religion is one thing, and it's a very important thing. But spiritual is greater. And I was asked one time whether I would, uh, the priest asked me whether I would like to do his sermon for him and it was on religion, and I said, no, I couldn't do that, but if you want me to speak on spirituality, I will. And he said, yes, I have no doubts. <laughs> <laughs> Arthur, you mentioned that Swami Sai Baba took you to the bottom. Yes. How? What did he make you do? Well, I'll tell you, it started from the moment I left home. Uh, on the plane, Empty seats right around me, no one to speak to. And that was okay. But uh, it was leaving family, uh, going on a journey that I didn't know how it would turn out. And so I was feeling sad in one way. And in the middle of that, <clears throat> as we flew over Australia, a young boy of about eight, dark skin, came and touched me on the leg and said, hello. And I said hello to him. And he stood watching me and he said, have you left any children at home? Oh. <laughs> And he, he must have seen the reaction in me, you see. And he said, wait. And he ran away. And he came back with a drink. Drink this. A little boy? Yeah. Who was he? Hmm? Who was he? <laughs> I'll tell you. <clears throat> because he gave me the drink and then he went away. A little while after, he was back, and he had a parcel. And there were things, I don't know where he got them from, but uh, something for children. And he said, when you return home, take these to your children. I never saw him on the flight again. So that appearance happened. But it stirred me, you know, I sat there, tears flowing. And it, uh, for many years, it was like that. Whenever I was with Swami, the tears would just flow. Until one time, in my mind, I said, Swami, please, just for once, let me speak to you or look at you without tears. <laughs> Why? Uh, yeah. <laughs> That was okay. I just wanted to enjoy it and not have to look through tears. <laughs> and so he walked past about six feet. Then he turned round and he just stood there looking. 
straight into my eyes and the more he looked the more my smile widened until I thought I'd have to move my ears back you know <laughs> and it was such a wonderful experience so you know these things dig at your heart and it goes beyond all understanding because you experience inner standing. Inner standing. Yeah. Understanding is of the mind, and <clears throat> we know what the mind is. But inner standing is of the heart. And if you understand, then you're free. Are you free? Uh, except when my wife tells me to do things. <laughs> <laughs> Can you share a couple of more occasions when Swami took you down low, perhaps. Maybe here, maybe at home. Well, here for a start on that particular journey, I, I felt that I didn't know how I could continue to try and eat the food and everything else. But after 10 days, Swami gave me an interview. And so I went in and he was talking to a number of people. Then he looked at me and he said, how is your health? What had happened when he had touched me on the head out in the line, uh, that afternoon I had dysentery. Mm. I really had a clean out, you know, for three days. And so when I went in to the interview room, and Swami said, how is your health? I said, struggling to say something. And I said, fairly well, Swami. Mm -hmm. Oh, he said, not so good. Not so good. I'll give you something to improve your health. And he spun his hand and he materialized a Rudraksha. And uh, because of tears in the eyes, I thought it might have been a pill, but he explained straight away. And he said, place this in water every day and drink the water, which I did. From that moment on, I really started to get ill. Ill? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that drinking this water was doing something to me, but because he told me to do it, there was no way that I could stop. Mm -hmm. And so gradually I went downhill and uh, I had developed a very bad cough. There was a man in the room with me and he said, were you ever a smoker? And I said, yes, I used to be years ago, but I, I don't smoke anymore. He said, you may have been due to have lung cancer and Swami might be getting rid of that for you. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't terribly interested in that. I was too sick. So at that particular time, with the birthday coming up, they put uh, we foreigners down into the hostel, or the girls. No, the hostel. They were just building it. Mm -hmm. The first floor was there. And so we were sleeping in there. But the doctor gave me some medicine and the complaint seemed to thrive on it. It got worse. <laughs> and so to the point that I'd collapsed. I was fortunate that I'd been given a, an air bed to be on. And I couldn't get up or do anything. <laughs> they got a doctor for me and the doctor came, wrote out a prescription uh, another prescription mm -hmm. and uh, but it was the same stuff that I'd had before which wasn't doing me any good at all but as two men took that up to the ashram to uh, have it uh, dispensed another doctor stopped those two men and said don't have that prescription filled hmm. he said uh, Swami has sent for me and told me to go to this man twice a day now until he is well. And it was the wildest treatment I'd ever had. What was it? You know, he was scratching in a bag, pull a paper bag out and 
Uh, and have one of these, <laughs> and scratch around again, have one of these too, and have a sip out of this bottle. <laughs> and, uh, but he, he patted me, he said, you are not to worry, Swami has sent me and we are going to make you well for his birthday. And that was four days away. Within a number of hours, I knew I was getting better. That's wonderful. Yeah. I started to get better. The next day, I was able to take a shower. That's wonderful. And there used to be, I found out there was a little shop up in the village where I could get rolled oats porridge. And I thought that was heaven. Mm -hmm. And so I had some. And uh, on the birthday, I was very fragile, but I managed to get up there. And as I was coming to the Purnachandra Hall, I'm thinking to myself, there's no way I can sit on the floor. And as I got to the hall, a man came out and said, come, there's a chair here. Mm. Everything, Everything was, taken, was care. taken care of. Everything. S Swami today is much quieter than he was in the 90s and yes. 80s and 70s. Yeah. Paint us a picture of what he was like back in the late 70s when you met him. He would uh, talk to you almost every day. You could give letters out, you could have things blessed. And uh, he was just a joy, a smile. And you know, the various aspects of Swami, uh, his sense of humor is wonderful. And he teases the students. And one time, uh, <clears throat> like if he ever wanted me, he would call it lion and I'd go to him. But this day he didn't do that. He was talking to the students in the Mandia and suddenly he stepped out the door and he looked across at me and he just went, <laughs> <laughs> never said a word. I didn't know what this was about. But I went to him and I said, yes, Swami. He said, oh, the boys just want to see you. <laughs> I said, see me, Swami? <laughs> yes, they really want to see you. Go inside. <laughs> so I walked into where the students were and there was a great roar came from the students. And I knew Swami had been up to mischief. But that doesn't matter. You're with him and he's speaking with you. And the glory of that is beyond expression. Sometimes I wonder if it's the meaning of his words that he speaks to you about, or if it's his presence that has the larger value to you. Everything about him. You can't say it's just the presence and, and, and not what he says. Every single thing about him is absolutely wonderful. The love is beyond any expression. And it's that love that makes you cry. I was just out in the village a little while ago and a, a man had a problem and I went to speak to him about it. There was another man there called out to me so I, I went to him and he's crying. I said to him, what's wrong? He said, Swami came past me this morning and he looks straight into my eyes and I can't stop crying. <laughs> That's wonderful. It's marvelous, you see. And now, uh, most of the time now, I, I can remain above that, but it still happens. Why you? Why you and a mere one or two or three million others? who are devotees of Sai Baba. Why not everybody in the world? For each there is a separate journey. And we all have to go through a particular life, a particular role we have to play. It's like not all fruit ripens at the one time. It depends when you're ready for it. And he knows. You see, many people think that they've decided to come here and, uh, and they're responsible for being here, but it's not the truth. As Swami said once, 
And he said, firstly, for your good fortune in coming to me, you must give thanks to the merits earned in previous lives. But it's not only that. He also said, some of you come here because of sickness, some because of worries, some because of fears. But that's not the reason. The reason is you're here because you've been called here. Now, and I don't necessarily mean just called here. We don't exclude people who can't get here but are very devoted to Swami, have great love for him. So uh, he said, those of you who come to me, you come to him without coming here. You see, because you're talking now about formless God in human form. Mm -hmm. And that's everywhere. Mm -hmm. You can't be away from that. And your beautiful wife, Poppy. Yes. Did she come to Swami with the same ease and the same loveliness that you did? Yes, uh, Poppy came. Uh, three years after. We, we weren't married until after that. Okay. You see? And uh, I thought that I was just going to sit on the mountaintop and gaze at my navel, you know. <laughs> but Swami knew I needed somebody to look after me. And he made a wonderful choice. I often say she's my little Greek goddess. <laughs> yeah. So the beautiful part is, you see, that we uh, travel the world, speaking in different countries. We work as a team. Uh, one time I used to move about on my own. Uh, but now we have the, the wonder of being able to work together like this. It's beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. How has Swami changed your life? He brought uh, a love into my life. I don't want to make this sound too easy because I went through many hardships and I say that I've kept Swami so busy at times looking after my health. But with the sickness I had in the beginning here in the first visit, that was nothing to what I had later on. And I went through a major heart attack. But when I took his babuti, the sacred ash, everything stopped. And the doctors then could find nothing wrong with me. <laughs> so the enormity of that is beyond expression. How can you say anything about it except tell a story? And the story limits what really happened. And in, that was 1986, 1987. I had a hernia. And when I arrived in the ashram, it became strangulated. And I had an Australian doctor here was looking at me. And uh, in the finish, he said, I'm worried about you. With this, he said, you'll have gangrene. Mm -hmm. He said, stay on your bed, don't even get off it. So I did for another three days, but it was getting worse. So I said to Howard Murphy, you'd know of him. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, I said to him, when Swami comes out in the morning, ask him if I should go to Bangalore for an operation. So he did that. When Swami came out, he told him that I had a problem. And he said, yes, I know. I know. He said, this pus, pus. In other words, it's gone bad. But he said to Howard, but you must not worry about him. I'm looking after him. I will take care of him. 
bring him up this afternoon or have him brought up this afternoon in a wheelchair and uh, they took me up it was awkward it was a wheelchair had no footrests and so with that complaint it was a bit difficult but they're little things they don't matter but when I went up there Swami took a Chinese group in or sent them in then he beckoned for them to wheel me forward when I got to him, he struck me on the leg, the leg, arm, arm, and then took my hand and said, stand up, go inside. Mm. So I went in and slid down the wall and sat on the floor. So when he came in, he looked at me and he said, you've got pain. But being a big Australian, you know, I said, it's all right, Swami. And he looked again and he said, you've got pain. And I said, yes, Swami. So he pulled his sleeve up, turned his hand like that, bang. And uh, three pills, three long white pills fell from his hand into my hand. They had brand names on them, but none of the doctors or the Indian doctors had any idea what they were. I just say they came from Swami's pharmacy. <laughs> he said, take one now. No water, mind you. <laughs> take one now. And I took that. And he uh, uh, then took the other two off me and wrapped them in tissue paper and put them in my pocket like I was a little boy and I might lose them. <laughs> and he said, one this evening, one tomorrow morning. I said, yes, Swami. And then he talked to the Chinese group. And uh, after some time, he looked at me and he said, come. And he took me into the private room. And I saw two chairs and I thought we were going to sit down and discuss the problem. But he swung me round and stood me with my back to the wall where the others couldn't see me. And he said, a very bad hernia. Mm. I said, yes, Swami. Up come the sleeve again, and he circled his hand, and then he flipped it over, and it was covered in a yellow fluid like oil. And he massaged that into the hernia. Then he went to get, uh, you know, I had to undo the belt and that. And so uh, he went then to get a cloth to wipe his hand. Uh, when he came back, he came back as the mother. They say about that, it's the love of a thousand mothers. And he just looked into my eyes. Even now, <laughs> it brings tears. But the point is, he, while he was looking into my eyes, he reached down, he lifted my shirt, he straightened the trousers, tucked the cords in, and put the short down, shirt down, just like I was a little boy. <laughs> and he said, now you can go to Bangalore and just have a very small operation. In my mind, I thought, I'm not going to be here for Christmas. This was the 18th of December. And uh, as quick as I thought that, he said, it's all right, you'll be back before Christmas. <laughs> because you can hide nothing from him. Mm -hmm. He knows your whole life. He knows your past, your present, your future, every single thing. And, uh, but he said to me, don't worry about anything. I will make all the arrangements I will take care of everything. And what did he do then? He sent two doctors to see me to come back to him and tell him what was wrong with me. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, Swami is a stickler for protocol. Doctors have a role to play. And he sees that that happens. So they reported back to him. And next, uh, Mr. Kutumba Rao was here at that time. 
and he came up to see me and he said, all arrangements are made. He said, uh, the car will be here at six o'clock in the morning. Excuse me, Marcus. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, we'll be here at six o'clock in the morning and take you to Bangalore. You'll meet up with a devotee doctor there and he will take you to a hospital. So uh, this is what happened. We got to the hospital, uh, the surgeon examined me. Whatever Swami had done, it was like watching it happen to somebody else. There was no concern being in a, a little hospital, antiquated operating theater, you know. And so I said to the doctor, uh, what sort of an anesthetic will you be using? Oh. And he said, uh, oh, he said, uh, we've got several types, what would you like? <laughs> and I said to him, I don't know too much about it. The last one I had was in the back of the hand. Oh, he said, we'll do that. <laughs> then I said, will you be uh, putting a, a support in so that it doesn't happen again? Oh, yes, I've been told everything must be taken care of. So I said to him, well, my friend who had to come with me, uh, is there any handy place nearby where he can get food for us. He said, I've been told that you must be cared for. He said, my wife will do the cooking and send her to the hospital. Mm. But everything was taken care of. And uh, on the operating table for the next day, I uh, was there and they put my hand out and so forth and I said no, I'm talking to myself. In a the moment they'll put the needle in the back of the hand and oh yes there it is. Uh, any moment now I'll feel a sting then I'll wake up in the room upstairs. Just the way it happens of course. <clears throat> and it was very simple but the bed itself had a steel mm -hmm. base with a horsehair rug that thick. I had more pain from the back <laughs> than I did from the operation. But the doctor came back on the third day to see how I was getting along. And I said, no, I'm fine, thank you, doctor. I'm ready to leave. And he said, leave? You can't possibly leave. No chance you can leave. I said, the car's waiting. And he said, I don't care. You cannot leave the hospital. But he said, I'll see how it's coming along. So he took the dressing off and he looked at it and he looked at me, he said, yes, you can go. <laughs> and I sat, uh, sat up to have a look and it was totally healed. <laughs> and, uh, and he can do anything. <laughs> so I ask you again, how has Sai Baba changed your life? Well, this is one of the things that's doing it, you see. <laughs> All these things that have happened, <clears throat> The heart attack, pancreatitis. Oh. Uh, he came to me then too, six times in hospital, with look getting worse each time. He came to you in the physical form. No, he, no, no. In, he, in your dreams. Mm -hmm. As spirit. As spirit. Yes. Uh, I said, uh, Swami, you told me that you'd be with me. You'd always to me. Now all I've got left. From there on, I started to better. The last attack I had, a very bad one. Uh, it was the worst that I'd had, and I didn't seem to be improving. Uh, three weeks on Dean, you know, mm -hmm. it's not, not a thing to have, but it's good to say, stop the pain. But uh, uh, just when I thought things not so good, so much so that I said to Poppy, I said, I don't know what the Lord has in store for me, but if he's saying it's time, let us just accept that. Don't worry about it. Everything is okay. Poppy wasn't ready for that. She said, Arthur Hilker, if you die, I will jump on your ashes. <laughs> and I, I say, out of fear, I got better. <laughs> but actually, Swami sent Babuti over to me with the lady that was coming home. Give these to the lion. 
And uh, then I recovered. I've never had it since. Who is Sai Baba? Hmm? Who is Sai Baba? <laughs> For me, God in human form is divinity itself. And the world is in such a mess that the Father himself has come. As he said, he can solve all the problems with one sweep of his hand. But we had slipped back into it again. It has to come through a learning process of coming to understand that this great play of consciousness is such that we have to play out our role that we're given from the beginning. But we play out that role with joy because the other aspect of it is that which is expressing itself through the form of sight. A tremendous love. If you had one lesson to teach your children, your neighbors, the people of America and around the world about Sai Baba, what would that one lesson be? There can only be one thing. As he says, love all, serve all. Because it comes so simple. Yes, we can't let people trample on us or do things wrong to us, but we must love the indweller. We may, we may have to deal with the behavior, but separate the indweller from that. Deal with the behavior, but always love the person, regardless of what role they're playing in life. Mm -hmm. Because in all the lives we've played, we surely must have learned not to be judgmental of the role of others. Mm -hmm. Because in those many, many roles that we've played, they haven't all been good ones. Mm -hmm. Because it's brought us to wherever we are at this time. Do you have any regrets? Any regrets? No, I can't even say that I regret I didn't find out earlier in life because I'm here. Mm -hmm. it, he, he brought me along. He taught me things, a lot of it through hardship, but most of it through enormous love. And uh, If people can only understand that... I spent a, a week once with Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross mm. and uh, during a break uh, there was a man sitting beside me and he started to cry. And I said, what's, what's the matter? Why are you crying? And he said, Arthur, there's no love in my life. There'd been no love in my life for 30 years and I can't take it anymore. And I said to him, <clears throat> how do you feel about yourself? He said, I hate myself. Hmm. Oh, why do you hate yourself? He said, I did something wrong to somebody 30 years ago. Hmm. And I've never forgiven myself. So I said to him, would you do it again? No, I'd never do it again. Then why don't you be joyful that you've learned something mm -hmm. out of the experience? Bring that person into your mind and explain why it happened, what you got from it, and that you would never do it again and ask for their forgiveness. Because first you must love yourself for who you are. If you love yourself for who you are, you project love to others. And when you project love to others, love comes back tenfold. Mm -hmm. Love is the greatest power in the world. And uh, 
as a man in a country where there'd been a coup, he'd been the prime minister, mm. he said to me, there's only one thing, Arthur, that can save this country, and that's love. Uh, that's the strongest of all things. Mm. If you can't love everybody, then you're lacking. It's very sad. Do you have any doubts? None whatsoever. None whatsoever. Uh, for instance, um, if Swami, for instance, walks past me just looking at me and with a stern face and says nothing, it's wonderful. <laughs> because you're there with him. No doubts. Matter of fact, I've been very blessed in a way is that from the very moment that I first read about Sai Baba, there's never been a doubt. Wow. There was one thing <clears throat> before I came the first time, and I, for me, I knew who he was the moment I read. This is what I wanted. This is what I've been waiting for. But there was one thing troubling me, so because I knew who he really is, I said, Swami, please tell me, are you really calling me or is it my monkey mind? Please show me. Two days later, I was running a training program in another city and I went out to buy some lunch. I had a picture of Swami under the plastic in my wallet and, and I pulled it out to get money it's covered in verbuti. <laughs> that wasn't easy because I'm trying to run a training program. <laughs> and keep focus. <laughs> but while I'd get them busy with something, I'd pull the wallet out and have another look and oh, it's still there. So you see, he answered me that simply and uh, he knows everything. Uh, for example, uh, was a, a doubt I had one time, not about Sai, <clears throat> but I'd been uh, in the north in a particular cave. And uh, I had some experiences in that cave. Things appeared to me, even a language I didn't know. Mm. All I wanted to do was get to Swami and ask him and I'd gone crazy. So he was at Whitefield and uh, I would go in at those times with the students and uh, he called me. He said, tell them some of your experiences. And here's my chance. And I said, Swami, should I tell them about the cave? He said, yes, tell them. And I said, Swami, should I tell them the experiences I had there? Yes, tell them everything. And I said, Swami, were they real experiences or were they mind? He said, they were real experiences. Tell them everything. So you see, uh, but as for having any doubts about him, never. Share one of those experiences in the cave with us that you've told me here the other day. I, uh, they were doing a puja in this cave, the abode of Shiva. Mm -hmm. And as the pundit <clears throat> started chanting and doing the puja, which was very loud, uh, I found myself as if a veil had come up and I was separate to the others. And I found myself chanting softly in a language that I didn't know. And there was enough of me still there to say, I've got to stop this. They'll think I've gone crazy, <laughs> you know. And eventually I did stop it. But then at the, uh, towards the end of the puja, uh, the prayer, uh, we sat in silence. 
And then for a Westerner, a golden Ganesh appeared with its hand in blessing. So my eyes are closed, you see, um, and I see this. And then it's slowly faded, and then Lord Shiva appeared. Mm. And then Lord Shiva changed to the Nataraj, the dancing Shiva. And, uh, and that uh, blew me away, <laughs> you know. It's a very big experience uh, for a Westerner, and yet Swami has given me things. The first thing he gave me was the Rudraksha, mm -hmm. you know, the tea of Shiva, the eye of God. You ran into a Swami there who told you to come back and say something to Sai Baba. Yes, I'm not... Uh... Who was that, Jody? That story he shared with us? The cave in, Mon in Nataraj. In Nantaraj, Nataraj, the cave in Nataraj. And the it, Swami in Nataraj. The Swami there. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> I saw a yogi. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, my pausing was, I'm just not quite sure okay. whether to put it on. But we'll, you can always cut it out later. Follow your heart. Uh, the point is, <clears throat> the last trip up there, he said uh, to me, Arthur, when you see Sai Baba, tell him that the Maha Avatar sends his love. And he will speak with you. So getting ready for Christmas, and uh, I want Swami to bless the children's drama and uh, instead of looking at it there he said come inside so I went in and then I said after it said it was good uh, I said Swami you know of my love to be with holy ones and he said yes I know I said I've been with the barber of Nanital and he said for me to tell you that the Maha Avatar sends his love and that you would speak with me. So, Swami, I swear his eyes glistened, but he said to me very softly, yes, I will talk with you. Um, but that didn't happen for a long time. <laughs> uh, Let's bring it up to today, December 20th, 2006. You're on the veranda. Swami comes to you and takes your letters. Is the thrill still there? Does your heart still skip a beat? Do you sense Baba just as much? Does it ever leave? Yes. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. You think that you're strong and right again, but you get in and Swami does something or says something to you and the tea is well up again, you know. The light, because it's at that tremendous, tremendous love. You've had many interviews with Sai Baba? Many interviews? Yes, I have. If you've had one more chance to ask him a question, what would it be? I don't have any questions. <laughs> None at all. In all honesty. And we have a few minutes left, and I'd like to talk to Poppy. And if you were to tell me one question to ask Poppy about her experience with Sai Baba, what might it be? Give me an idea. Oh, this is a... <laughs> this is a this is a hard one. Um, perhaps Poppy should decide that. Okay. Arthur, thank you so much. You've been a blessing to all of us. I still can't get over the feeling that you're special. And I know Baba doesn't want any of us to feel we're special. So one last comment on how do you not feel special? How do you keep your ego at bay when, when Swami blesses you over and over again? 
very simple come to know you can say to yourself I know nothing I can do nothing I am nothing but at the same time knowing that you are everything Amen Amen and Om Sairam. Sairam. Om Sairam. Poppy, it's such a delight to have a chance to ask you a few questions. And off camera, of course, author Arthur said, ask Poppy how much you love him. And I'm assuming he's talking about how much you love Baba. No, it was actually in an interview. Okay. And Swami looked at me and he said, and that was the only question that he asked in the group, I might add, not just by ourselves. He said, do you love him? Yeah. And of course the tears just rolled down my face and I said, yes, Swami. And Swami's eyes just rolled around in his head as if to say, oh yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so that was all there was to it. But it was quite embarrassing to be asked a question like that in front of everybody. And how long did it take you to come to know Swami, to come to be with Sai Baba and read the books and talk to people before you really knew this was a big change in your life? Well, I knew nothing about Sai Baba at all until a friend had actually lent us a book, um, Sai, Baba, no, yeah, Sai Baba Man of Miracles by uh, Howard Murphy. Mm -hmm. And once I read that, I th it struck my heart. I knew that if Jesus was alive on earth today, I would want to be there. And we had illness in the family, so we decided we'd come because we wanted to have a miracle to happen. Mm -hmm. And it did happen. So within three months we were here. So I hadn't been to any centres, I knew nothing about India, nothing about Swami other than what I'd read in the book. So we really came cold turkey. And of course it was a great cultural shock when we arrived, and I thought, what have I done? But we were, yes, we came. Um, my, our first um, visit to Swami was in Whitefield. And he came out and just walked around maybe for five minutes. And then he went. And I thought, I've come for all these thousands of miles <laughs> to see him. And he didn't even give a, a talk like you would a minister at church. I, you know, I expected him to sort of stand up at the pulpit and tell us what was right and what was wrong. And uh, I asked a couple of ladies that were sitting beside me and they got the giggles. They thought it was really funny. And I became quite angry. And, um, but another lady was very kind and she said, Swami's not going to be here long. So she said, you'd be better to go to put a party, settle in and be ready for when he comes. And that's what we did. And we were here for six weeks. Six weeks? Your six, first time? First time, six weeks. I don't do things by hearts. Ah, I guess not. <laughs> and uh, we had a wonderful time. I had a wonderful time. And uh, loved the bhajans, loved Swami, couldn't get enough of him. And um, they said that Swami would never take anybody into the interview room in a wheelchair. So we sort of half accepted that, but still praying for an interview. And um, my son, could I have a drink of water, please? My son had a dream the night before, and um, he said, Swami's going to take us in for an interview, Mum, but you have to ask. So I was sitting uh, with my daughter in the, in the lines and Swami came by and Debbie's nudging me and said, Mum, you have to ask. And I said in a very quiet voice, interview Swami. And he walked on. She said, you have to say it louder, Mum. So I said, interview Swami. And he turned around and said, eh? I said, interview please, Swami. And he said, how many? I said, four, Swami. He said, go. So that was our interview. It was really beautiful. He spoke to all of us, advised us, told us that we would be okay, and we assumed that that meant that there would be a healing, 
But that wasn't quite right. Mm. But whatever it was, it was really fantastic. What do you believe Swami means when he says to people who have a loved one who is sick and dying, everything is going to be all right, don't worry, it's going to be all right. What do you think he means by that? Well, now I understand that it means that maybe their passing will be okay, that they will go on to a better life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it doesn't stop the euphoria that you have at the time. Mm -hmm. You leave here feeling that nothing can touch you. It's just, just beautiful. In all the years now that you've been coming with Arthur, I think I know the answer to this. Has Baba transformed your life? A little. Just a little. <laughs> oh. I, I'm not the same person that I was then. Um, I was very rigid in my way of thinking. There was no, there was only black and white. There was no grey or pinks. And all that's changed. Mm -hmm. And it's only thanks to him. Yeah. And if you were able to tell a newcomer who got off the bus and saying, the bus stopped in Puttaparthi, here I am in front of this ashram, I have no idea who this man is. What would you tell them about Sai Baba? I would tell them that they're so very fortunate that their lives will change. Some people are frightened by that. They don't really want to be changed mm -hmm. and they don't know what the change will mean. But you can assure them that whatever the change is, it'll just be fantastic. And how has your life changed? Well, I'm very contented. I don't look for external happiness. Um, I don't find any people difficult to get on with. <laughs> Wherever we go, there's just beautiful people around us. And it's just a great life. Does it bother you or disturb you at all that Swami isn't as accessible any longer as he once was 15, 20 years ago? It would be lovely to have those days back again. I mean, there's no denying that. But his love, he seems to be even greater today than it was then. Really? Yes. Now, how is that possible? I've no idea. But it just feels. You can come, come here and you just feel the love. It's absolutely beautiful. And there's not that urgency that people used to have. And are we going to have an interview? Will Swami give us an interview? Well, that seems to have left the ashram now. So there's a greater peace here than there was in those days. Two more questions. Who is Sai Baba? To me, Sai Baba is everything. I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for Sai Baba. Question number two. Who is Arthur Hillcote? Arthur Hillcote is my husband. A wonderful, wonderful man and my best teacher, other than Swami. Papi, thank you very, very much. Sai Ram.